Recording is in progress. As we mentioned, just a few minutes of review, and then we'll go forward. In this Maimah, the previous Rebbe is addressing the Adon Olam. We're all familiar, we say it every morning. The master of the world, who was the king before he formed any matter. And the basic question is, how could you be the king if there isn't anything to be the king over? The term king is a reference to a relationship. There has to be subjects. You can't be a parent without children. You can't be a sibling without siblings. So we also asked, why is this such an important prayer that right after we do the basic acknowledgments of how good we are your tents, we talk about like the first thing is the Adonoma. What is so special about this Adonoma? And then, as we often do, we sort of put that to the side. We went back to talk about an, the idea that on Rosh Hashanah, our objective is to build the Malchus. That's what the phrase is, Binyan HaMalchus. Now, one of the great gifts of Hasidus is that it puts terms and useful handles onto concepts that are innately amorphous. Meaning, not so much in this mimer, but as an example, when we talk about something like love, so we tend to think love is some abstract philosophical idea that a person feels love for another person, love for an activity, love and enjoyment. We use the words, I love my parents and I love my children, but certainly that kind of love is different from each other. We even say we love swimming and we mean different things by that. And generally speaking, we are satisfied to sort of use those words roughly and a little uh, loosely better. And we're not real precise in what we mean with these words. But then when we start to break down what we mean by these particular words, not only does it become more precise and more defined, we can start to understand what's going on within our relationships and here we're talking, of course, about our relationship with Hashem, but it is true also in our relationships with, with other people, and how we can restructure them, direct them, maximize them, and truly understand what's going on. So Hasidus is Torah. It also gives us certain elements that are similar to what we call Freudian analysis or a structure like Wahhabiel in many uh, communities, they have, you know, Myers-Briggs and uh, other forms that try to give us definitive terminology to help us understand personalities, interactions, what, so to speak, is going on in a level that may not be evident and tangible. So what we're talking about is the infinite, but we're using terminology of the finite, and they're never going to be absolute rigid digits that fit in nice and, and perfectly, any more than our attempt to use uh, colors. And when I say blue and you say blue, we may not be thinking of precisely the same shade of blue, but we can start to break it down and we start to give it particularism and nuance. So in our context, we are talking about the idea that we will motivate Hashem to want to be Melech, king. And as we've talked about so many times, why would Hashem want to be king? Isn't that a demotion? I mean, he's God. Why does he want to be king? Because God is abstract, and king is very much relationship. And we are talking about us motivating Hashem, but does Hashem want to be king? And you can hear already, hopefully, in the background, that when we make this declaration, Adon Olam, Asher Malach, the master of the world, who was the king, meaning this is what prompts Hashem to create the world, is his desire to be king. And again, king to us may sound like the guy who bosses you around, but as it relates to Hashem, it's a reference to the relationship side. Again, in contrast to, I don't know, it sounds like an almost ridiculous thing to say, just being God. Because God is abstract, and king is very personal. So we've started to talk about these ideas about how a person is driven by their rutzai, their passion. And it's important that we nuance this because we, who are blessed, thank God, to not be worried about if you're going to have food for lunch, 
we we have the luxury to think that our rut site is for extravagance, even not, not necessarily bad things, but you know, we want to climb mountains and play the guitar and <clears throat> master Talmud and so on, which is all good things. But what we mean by our rut site is our absolute rut site, which is what drives everything about us, not some sort of whimsical uh, interest or desire. So we use the word rut site, which if you look it up in the dictionary, it translates as desire. Don't let it fool you or, or lure you into that idea that it's, again, some sort of abstraction, uh, hazy kind of uh, fantasy. It is what drives everything about us. And here is where Hasidus, and you know, like I say, got Hasidus in some trouble, makes the argument that Hashem's ratzai, Hashem's passion, desire, is what drives creation. Meaning, there's a tendency to think that Hashem created the world. We have this world. Hashem, hmm, what am I going to do with these people and kill each other? Okay, here's a bunch of rules. So then, Hashem is here to serve me. Meaning, how do I make sure I have a meaningful, spiritually transformative, uplifting life? I follow Torah and mitzvahs. And the answer to that is yes, you know, absolutely. We definitely believe that leading a life of Torah and mitzvahs is its own reward. It is a pleasant life. All God's ways are ways of good and pleasant. But then the arbiter ultimately is, how does Hashem serve me? And what is God doing for me? Does he give me happiness, joy, meaning, peace, and so on? And that's a great <coughs> marketing tool that if you keep Torah and mitzvahs, you'll have a better life than someone who doesn't keep targets. And we agree with that. I don't disagree with that. But that's not very satisfactory. Because you, that's what you say. How do I know I'm going to invest my whole life in Torah and mitzvahs? And what if I get to the other end and I'm disappointed? So this guy comes down the pike and he tells you, no, 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 follow my system and it will be better. And this one says, no, 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 follow my system. And everybody is competing that their system, they got the key, they got the answer to uh, cure male pattern baldness and be thin and uh, forever youthful and happy and joy, et cetera, et cetera. And again, we believe that we can compete with that, but that's not what this is about. It's about Hashem's Ratzi. And many people may be familiar with the story that when the Alter Rebbe, the first Rebbe, this man was from the previous Rebbe, but the Alter Rebbe, when he was a student, by his teacher, who we call, his name is Rabdo Bear, from the <coughs> city of Mizrich, we call him the Magid, the teacher of Mizrich. The, the students were also a little like gun shy about should we be teaching everybody all of these things that were being taught? What about people who don't appreciate? Remember, nothing was written down until the Alter Rebbe wrote down the Tanya. And they were a little hesitant, you know, you know, you start sending these ideas out there amongst the unwashed masses, and who knows what kind of misunderstandings or deliberate distortions will come about. And one day, somebody in the group was very distraught because he found some notes of one of the Magid's teachings. Voldus was rolling around the streets. I mean, somebody had had such disregard for the teachings of the Magid that they just let it go like garbage. And they were like, oh my gosh, look what's happened. People are mistreating it. We're speaking about such subtleties here that uh, it's, it's like the, the, the most delicate thing. And people are, are so crass and careless with it. Maybe we're making a big mistake. Maybe we should stop doing this. It's too, it's too much out there in the public. So as the story goes, the Alter Rebbe responded with a metaphor. It's a king metaphor. You know, in Jewish life, there's two types. There's the king or the tailor. Once upon a time, there was a king. And the king had a son. And the son was the apple of his eye. But what happened? The son got sick. So the king, of course, called every doctor imagine. He, the story goes that he had a son who was a prince, right? He did have a son who was a prince. And he called every doctor and every healer and everybody had this potion and that potion, but it didn't work. And finally came along one doctor. He said, look, this is a chance. It's a maybe. In the center of the king's crown, which is the embodiment of the king's family and his kingdom and all that is distinctive to this culture, there sits this special diamond. And if we will take that diamond and crush it up and pour it down the king, the, the prince's throat, this maybe will cure him. But the king was hesitant to do that. You know, that diamond costs money. It's not just about the financial, but it represented, I mean, this was 
potentially spoiling the whole kingdom. But of course, if there's no prince, then there's no point of having the kingdom because when the king will die, the kingdom will dis disintegrate anyway. So they tried this and they tried that. But what happened? The, king, the prince got sicker. He got so sick that his mouth became clenched. And now they didn't even know if he could swallow even a little bit of this powder. But it was so desperate that the king said, I'll try, even though it's true that he, most of it is going to spill and, and, and be wasted. This, the Alter Rebbe said, is a, a metaphor for what we're doing with chassidus. You know, the Jewish people, nothing new under the sun, were feeling very disconnected. They were feeling like, it's not for them, and it's not. So we try everything. Oh, yes, it is. <laughs> it's more fun than you can imagine. Oh, and it's so meaningful. And then we give the lecture. You know, you think they're happy there with their helicopters and their diamonds? They're not happy. They're really miserable. And we tell you a story about some millionaire who's really miserable. And then they say, well, I don't, I don't have a helicopter, and I'm miserable. Okay, okay. Well, I got a better idea. You know, think vegan will be teach you to be healthy. We'll tell you that kosher will teach you. You know, we tried everything. It doesn't work. So he said, okay, I'll tell you what, it's really the crown jewel. The crown jewel is really that this is Hashem's passion. Will you do it for Hashem? So people say, you can't say that because they can become manipulative. Uh -huh. Oh, Hashem wants, well, in that case, I want a bike. I'll tell you what, we'll make a deal. This is what you give me what I want, I'll give you what you want. And there is a certain mercantile character characteristic that some people find meaningful in their Yiddishkeit. I give God what he wants, and he gives me what I want, and I won't bother him too much, and he won't bother me too much. And I'm satisfied with that. You know, I don't bother God too much. I show up on Rosh Hashanah, I show up three times a day. I don't show up three times a day, and he gives me what I want, and that's it. And Siddhis is saying that's not what people want. What they want is a passionate, meaningful sense that they are really genuinely personally connected with Hashem. That's really what they want. They don't just want this sort of like, what do I got to do? It won't bother me anymore. So in order to prompt them, we have to tell them that there's something that Hashem wants so passionately that he was willing to create the world. And what is that? It is to be in a connected relationship with us. And that is what we are hoping to achieve every year on Rosh Hashanah that Hashem should want that relationship with us and that we should want it with Hashem. And every time Hashem says it has to be a greater relationship, I'm not willing to do this one again. I don't just want another 5781, not because 5781 was bad, but now it's 5782, we better step it up. And if we don't step it up, you know, I saw this movie already. So here the Alter Rebbe is talking about that Ratzoy, Hashem's passion is what drives him, drives Hashem to do all the things that he does. And again, we use almost interchangeably the understanding of how we function to match the understanding of how Hashem functions. So <clears throat> we're talking, of course, about our relationship with Hashem, but it is true also in our relationship with ourselves and our relationship with others. So we are on page 12 in the middle of chapter Dalit. Uh, page 12, the middle of chapter Dalit. <clears throat> um, I don't know how to tell you exactly, but I'll count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve lines down, six words in. Now, means that we go into greater depth. That is, we're not just going to be um, talking about the terms, but we're going to really try to have a degree of understanding. So, now, in our relationship with Hashem, we have a very uh, delicate balance. On the one hand, we all want to feel very close with Hashem. On the other hand, we've got to remember that Hashem is not like a buddy. It's the same is true with a child and a parent. A child longs to feel closeness with their parent. What does the child want from the parent more than anything else is the whole parent. They want the essence of their parent. They want the parent's attention. They want their parent's identity. They want absolute, complete, and total alignment with the parent. At the same time, they want the parent to be a parent. They don't want the parent just to be like their buddy. So these two aspects are, are, are contained, and almost contradictory aspects, are contained within the quality of malchus. There is the melech quality, the sense that this is exalted, 
And it's hard for us, I know in this country, the Rebbe writes about this in a letter about Rosh Hashanah, because we're, we just think that our politicians are a bunch of you know, windbags, <laughs> whoever they are, and I'm not getting to the politics. Well, they're just a bunch of other people. And that this guy's my plumber, this guy's my senator. You know, he's just, a, we don't really believe that people have this exalted character. And on the contrary, we find somebody who seems to, and we just knock him down and we just knock him and we say, oh, he's just a phony. And when the door, you know, he's behind closed doors, he's just a regular guy, kicks off his shoes and plays with the dog and, you know, drinks beer. So it's a hard thing for us to get our arms around, to see that there are, there is an aspect that is at a whole other level. You know, hopefully in Kedusha, we do occasionally experience it. That's called a greatness, this exaltedness. <laughs> and then there is Ratzain, and Ratzain drives us down towards. So randomness is what evokes from people their admiration, I'll use that word, or reverence. And Ratzain is what drives the person to be connected with others. <clears throat> so here we go. On the one hand, you have Ratzai, which is a person's passion, which drives them to do what they do. And again, unfortunately, in our society, we think our passion is some sort of material accomplishment, not necessarily greedy, but I want to get a PhD, I want to be a doctor, I want to learn to play the guitar, not just I want my own submarine. But it drives the person to what their truest passion is. Now, our argument, of course, is that our truest passion is to be connected with Hashem, but Hashem's truest passion is connected with us. I want to have somebody explain that that in our world, we like to, like when you say it's somebody's true passion, like where they really are, like, I don't know if I want to see what that, like, I don't want to go there because because we suspect, and that's right, right, we know that when a person, you know, when you find out what's really, really in them, it's not going to be something that, you know, that's the whole, uh, what's it called, Freud thing. So, well, so, but, but it's true. In other words, your passion is where you really, really are. That's the essence of you. Now, with a person, depending on where he's at in life, his essence, or at least his accessible kind of, might be very crass, but it's that's who he is. So that's why we like it when we talk about God, because that's who God is. Obviously, when, when you talk about God, the the tiger doesn't have that sort of um, revolting, you know, like you want to get away from it. It doesn't talk about a person because a person's tigers could be not nice to watch, but it is really the essence. That's who he is. That's really pulling on his essence. So with God, right, that's pulling on the essence of God. It's obviously doesn't have that other aspect to it, and it's something, it could be something, uh, whatever, bad. Yeah, and Avo Imzetz, nevertheless, Hini Harotanu Koyach Benefesh, Varemus Inu Koyach Benefesh, Kiim Huha Etzem Ashum Lumum, the Etzem Matsada Etzem, Venu Koyach Apoyo, Urak Bedarach Siba, Bovad. What does it mean when we say that a person has this, um, the, this Rotsoy? Um, so here's a, a, another manner in which we start to sort of separate out these ideas. We have an idea that Ratzai is what drives the person, but who is the person? Who is he? And our answer there is found in the concept of Raymond's. Now, here's where we, which Raymond's is this exaltedness, this innate sense of uh, upliftedness. So it's important that we talk about these ideas. And again, Hasidus gives us handles to describe and thus to direct possible, uh, otherwise sort of amorphous ideas. So we ask ourselves, who am I? And it's the most basic level. So our instinct may be, not us of course, because we know better, but some people, our instinct is to start to describe things that we do. So I say, this is my favorite activity. These are my accomplishments. This is where I live. All of these are about who I am, but none of them are who I am because all of those things can be taken away and I am still myself. 
So if I define myself at a very simple level by my residence, well, if I move tomorrow, I'm still me. So those are aspects. They're what we would call in the Hebrew phrases, a koya, it's a specific ability of this person. But this characteristic that is called in Hebrew reimimus, which means the sense of exaltedness, the sense of that which is above and thus is desired by others to be close with, that's not something about me, that's me. This means that his innate identity, this is the essence of his character. When we say this, we're saying this both about human beings and Hashem? Well, in this context, we're talking about Hashem, but there is an aspect of each person in a reflection of Hashem that is their absolute identity. Now, with Hashem, his absolute identity is his randomness, his unknowability, his un his ungetability. You can never get him. That's the essence of Hashem. You know, it sounds almost silly, but the basic definition of Hashem is that he can't be defined. Right. I'm just thinking in terms of a person, if they would reach a, a, a level that they would be worthy of an exaltation, um, that's their essence. Well, that is, in a sense, it's like being a Kohen, or I'll give you an example. We have this with the governor Melech. When King David is on his deathbed, and he essentially appoints King Solomon to be the king, so we ask the question, well, how can you have two kings? That's a rule of thumb. You can't have two kings. Two kings can't have the same crown. So what are we saying? Is that King David is identifying that well, Solomon... Well, like microaggression. Rule of thumb. Rule of thumb, yeah. yeah. So King Solomon, he's identifying that he has this innate characteristic. He has this characteristic of king. You know, a person can learn to play the piano, even though he's not a piano player in his essence. So what we, we are distinguishing here, we're tending to distinguish it here, is direct aspects of our existence, directions of our existence. I, I guess the thing I'm struggling with is with, with the Kaddish Baruch Hu, it's not like <clears throat> there's any like Hashem in potential, right? But with human beings, that's very much the case. I could reach a level that I'm more worthy of, you know, respect and let's say use the word exaltation. That's, that, that's only things that, you know, I build as time goes on. So they do sound like something that's outside of myself. Well, with here, Kaddish Baruch Hu, that would never be the case. Absolutely. Here, with even within the person, we, we're making we could make the argument that there are certain innate characteristics. Sorry, there are certain innate characteristics that are pre-programmed to his identity. Now we may not discover them. We may not know them. I mean, we would say being a Jew is that that is innate to our character. I mean, all you know, nonsense aside, being male or female is innate to your character. I mean, it's true. You could put a dress on and be still a man. It's not, it, he is not, uh, that is the essence of his character. It's not something about him because it's unchangeable. You know, mm -hmm. the fact that I live in a certain neighborhood or that I have this profession or even that I enjoy certain music is changeable. It's something about me. It's not mm -hmm. who I am in my essence. So this is that push me, pull me <coughs> balance that we try to maintain with Hashem. We want a desire to be close and a sense of distance. is already to be close and a sense of distance. Um, so here, the, the Phoenix Rebbe is sort of acknowledging, you know, we're trying to really split hairs here. On the one hand, we're saying that my passion, my desire, which I direct to either acquire wisdom through I'm really going to sit and study, or I'm going to acquire a certain character trait because I'm going to really work on being generous or compassionate or patient, or I'm going to cut out some bad habits and stop biting my nails or being short-tempered with people. So that is a, a distinctive effort that is evoked from my rutzai. 
So it's the old, you know, to a captain, you know, captain sort of uh, idea that, right, we're trying to put real hard terms on something that doesn't really lend itself to that. We can't put digits on feelings, but we're trying to create a spectrum. So we have a whole series of arguments here or a whole series of ideas here. We have the very defined, uh, we're calling them here sort of external to my true identity behaviors. So I'm the person who goes on a walk every day. It's factual, but it's not the essence of my identity because tomorrow I can stop going on a walk. It's not, it doesn't make me who I am, or I'm sorry, it doesn't illustrate who I am, but it is something that I do. That's very much outside of my basic essence. This, on the other end of the spectrum, this thing that we're calling randomness, this exaltedness, is innate to my essence. And then I have this thing called Ratzon that I can direct to get me to acquire good character traits like studiousness or kindness or avoid bad character traits like laziness or whatever it may be. So that doesn't feel like it's external. It's driving the external, the tangible. But on the other hand, it's not really my innate identity. And you're right, you're right, you're also right. It's a spectrum. There isn't like this hard rigidity. But the more we can understand it, at least in some amorphous sense, you know, in the psychological psychology department, not the engineering department, we can work with it to transform it and to develop. I mean, the simplest illustration is with the parent, with the child, because we don't see it in ourselves. So everybody tries to direct their child to what their child's uh, true identity is. And we also want them to acquire good character traits. So we try to motivate them to be kind and studious and patient, et cetera, et cetera, and to avoid negative character traits. And we're also trying to see what is special about this child. What is distinctive? When I say special, I don't mean better. I mean, what is distinctive about the child? And we're, we're not so perfect at it. And we try our best to direct it. So again, we're using definitive terms. We're aware, we are conscious that those terms are <clears throat> rough estimates at best. And we're taking it from there. <laughs> so the author ever continues. Uh, so again, as the Alter Rebbe is talking about how the essence of our identity directs uh, and, and controls our behavior, it's in two forms. There is the Rutzain form that it says, okay, from now on, I'm getting up earlier. From now on, I'm going to be patient with people. So the rut side overrides my impulse is to sleep late or to be uh, running out the door. And my rut side directs me to uh, wait, to be patient, to get up early, whatever it is. In contrast to that, the Raymondness quality says that this is what is innate about my identity. Now, so again, in English, it sounds really good. And patient and behave, but behave patient. That's and correct. Must make me feel patient. Uh, go, uh, yes, right, spot on, correct. I remember in the high school, so we used to, used to talk to the girls about their seminary interviews, which like, were an extraordinarily big deal for them. So they were always worried because it's like this comedian says, you know, when you go internationally and you arrive at the border, they say, and what do you plan to do in our country? Murder people. I wasn't ready for your trick questions. You know, so they get all nervous. You know, they're going to get some question, and what if they say the wrong thing? So one of the questions that they ask them amongst you know silly questions and all the standard questions. You know, what do you do? Oh, I just spend all my time reciting tale. You know, well, sometimes I visit people in the hospital. You know, all that kind of nonsense. They ask them, you know, sometimes tough questions. So they would ask them, tell us something that's a flaw of yours. Now, here it says a very dangerous question. You say, well, I have a tendency to murder people. They may not want you in your, the school. If you say, I don't have any flaws. Then well. So what I suggested to them is you say, I have a tendency to sleep late or whatever it is. So I set three alarms and I get up on time. In other words, like you're saying, I'm still a late sleeper. I just set five alarms because my rut sign overrides my innate character. My innate character is like we say, there's no crime in being a bank robber. Just don't rob banks. You know, we're not looking to be good people, we're looking to do good things. It's, a, it, it's an important, important distinction. So my rut zone overrides my innate character. 
and my innate character expresses itself. So there's not everything about my innate character is unpleasant. Some things about it are in fact um, uh, uh, virtues. So we explain. So the consequence of obedience, in this context called bittel, that it results from rutzai, in contrast to that which results from roimimus, are going to be different. How does how does the rutzai? He breaks it. You want to sleep late? Get up anyway. He breaks that bad habit. I mean, we use that term, to break the pattern. Why? Because the Ratzon overrides it. But the Ravimus uplifts it. Now, this is a, again, you think about this with parents and children, uh, teachers and students, culturally. There are different ways in which we reshape people. So in a very cartoonish sense of the basic training drill sergeant, I don't know if this is representative of what it's like in real life, but the way it's always depicted is he comes out and he tells the arrogant, he picks up the most arrogant guy. He has him, you know, wash the floor with his toothbrush and he breaks him entirely. And then he rebuilds him in the mode and the model of the military. That's one way. That's one way to do it. You think you're a smart aleck, you shave your head, you make everybody dress alike. There's no rich or poor. There's no smart or dumb. There's no uh, advantaged versus disadvantaged. Everybody is down to zero. What? In the way, yeah. I mean, very much. That's no, kind of the edit. Poor, no, no. Right. Everybody gets the takrichim. Everybody gets the same treat. I mean, very much so. So that's a form of bittel. That is, we they use the term. We break them down and we rebuild them. Rutzen does the same thing. I'm a late sleeper. I'm breaking that. I'm breaking the bad habit. I'm breaking that. Raimimus is we make the person so desirous that they are uplifted and motivated to be uh, associated with that higher quality. This is a, a different form of motivation. So when we talk about being a melech, we're talking about two different aspects. Now, again, it's hard for us to get our arms around it because we don't have the idea of kings. When we think of kings, we think of you know self-serving uh, uh, dictators and so on. But if you think about it in the truest form, like we have in society, not in government, the true master who the students are devoted to. And we, of course, think of the Rebbe Hasid relationship. It even can exist, La Havio, with a great teacher or a great motivator and so on. People become devotees of a person. Why? Because on the one hand, they sense that there's something about this person that they are desirous of being associated with. On the other hand, or concurrently with that, they break down that aspect of themselves and transform it. <clears throat> so you got to have these two ideas coming together. You know, it's like, uh, again, maybe it's a little cartoonish, but it's that basic idea. So the high, the, the high school football star has all the coaches of the big time colleges come and knock on his door and tell him about how they're going to want him so desperately to come and play for their program. And he's going to be treated as a star and so on. The kid's all flattered because he's uplifted. Look at them. All the guys are knocking on my door. He finally signs and make a big deal. He shows up the first day. He's the lowest guy in the totem pole. Who's this? And they got him running laps and up and down. Said, where's that nice guy who sat in my dining room and 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 uh, swayed me and wooed me and wined and dined me into into coming here? You know, the neshama could say the same thing. You called me in. You told me you're sending me down into this world, and I'm going to change the world, and I'm going to bring holiness into this world that's filled with klipa. And you hit me on the helmet and you said, swear you would be good and not bad. And I was all gung-ho. And then I got down here and everybody's looking at me like, who are you? We're rookie and nobody and, and so on. And the, the gnat was here before you, et cetera. So these two aspects are going on within the king relationship. On the one hand, he lifts you up. On the other hand, he has to tell you what to do. So again, it's hard for us because 
we we find it hard to imagine that somebody really is motivated to that which is for the best of us. We just think they want us to do it for themselves. That kind of thing. We met. We met nimsa. And through this, we make it into our actual Ratzan. So whereas at first, I really want to sleep late, but I force myself to get up. We argue that buried deep within that is what is called the Ratzan HaKadam, the more primordial, the more essential Ratzan, which then becomes the evident Ratzan. <coughs> that is produced through kickstarting this surrender and this devotion to those who crown him. So when the person is truly devoted, we're on page 13. And again, you know, the, the example that comes to mind is the Chassid Rebbe relationship. So the Rebbe is, you know, uplifts the person and he tells them, you know, you can do it, you must do it, we need you, you're absolutely necessary. And he's the most relentless, demanding boss. I mean, it's kind of odd to us because in the early days, you can read the stories, people wrote to the Rebbe, I can't do this. And the Rebbe was like, yeah, you can. And, be a... and then there was a certain point where there was like, okay, fine, we'll get someone else, you know. Like, you don't want to do it? Fine, there's 10 other guys to take your place. Like, get to work here. We know more of this, you know, oh, I can't do it, and so on. So, you know, there's both aspects, which are both necessary. Um, Again, back to the king. What makes the person truly devoted to the king? When he believes that the king is truly devoted to the people. Meaning, as long as he thinks that the king is only out for his own self glorification, so why should I go stand in the mud so that the king should have glory? So, and I, I think I probably told this story before in a different context. Um, when I first came here 30 years ago, so we went for a Shabbos to a different Chabad house, and it was right after some election. And it was a young guy my age at the time. And he had served on the campaign of some guy who ran for a senator after I think Simon retired or whichever one of those guys. I can't remember the guy's name, <clears throat> except that the guy, not the guy that I met, but the candidate, he was running for everything. He was like some personal injury lawyer who made a lot of money, ran for senator, ran for district attorney. And then he wound up getting like arrested for some child molestation thing. And it's like, was it what? Was it and the guy is like, you know, he spent $50 million on these campaigns. He could have given that $50 million to a hospital and he would have been more famous, whatever it was. Anyway, so I meet this guy. And th this was actually a seminal moment in my life. So I'm not, you know, I'm not very political, you know. I mean, my parents wouldn't go to like political rallies. I say, you know, like people say we were twice a year Jews. We were twice a year political. You know, we voted twice a year and we knew the political party that we were affiliated with, but we did we knew about as much or I knew about as much as politics as the average Jew thinks he knows about Judaism. Hey, I heard something. And so in fact, Obama writes this in his book. He said when he taught constitutional law, he says this is probably how the guy in the in the in the clergy school thinks you know you teach a bunch of people who think they know the document better than they actually know. You know people think they know the constitution, but they don't. Like people think they know Torah. Anyway, so I meet this guy. And we're both like 25 years old and, you know, we're out to change the world and we're full of young enthusiasm. And the guy says, oh, you know, I worked on this campaign. And I'm like, wow, this guy. Really is this no, 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 this is a guy, another guy at the, at the table, another guy at the Shabbos table. So this other guy at the Shabbos table was talking about how he worked on this campaign and he was so disappointed that the guy lost. And then this was his exact words, which burned in my mind for 30 years. He says, well, there goes my instant career. And I, then I was shocked me. Because I'm thinking, oh, this guy, he really believed in this candidate. He really was the, he thought that this was how he's going to, no, he was just looking to hook his train to this guy, you know. And again, I'm not blaming him. That's why, you know, not everybody becomes a doctor because he wants to cure the world. Some people become a doctor. It's not a bad thing because it's a reasonable, respectable way to make a living. You do help people and you get paid. You know, if I could veer off for a moment just to use an, an, an illustration of this idea that we're familiar with. We know coming up in a couple of weeks is gonna be the anniversary of when the New York State Court ruled that the library belonged to the Hasidim. What's the backstory there? 
So where did these Sfarim and the money to buy these Sfarim come from? It came from the Hasidim that gave it to the previous rabbi, all the rabbi, not only the previous rabbi, but all the rabbi. So his biological descendant made a seemingly reasonable claim. You know, a person has their wealth, whatever they accumulate, uh, and then when their time comes, these things get inherited down to their descendants. That's the way of the world. So the counter argument that we made is that people weren't giving this money to this personal individual who did them a favor. You know, you have a doctor and he visits uh, the sick, you know, he makes house calls and uh, he doesn't charge the poor people. So people love him and they respect him, but he's still a person. And somebody wants to show their gratitude. So they buy him. What are you going to buy him? He's a doctor. So you buy him a medical thing because he's a doctor. So they argue the same thing. This is a rabbi. He's a very nice man. Everybody loved him. He doesn't charge you for his services. Well, what do you do to show your appreciation? You buy him a gift. Well, what do you buy rabbis? You buy him books. So you buy him books. The counter argument was, he's not a private person for himself. The people aren't giving it to this rabbi because he was very nice and he gave them advice and he gave them time and he gave them concern. That he is the embodiment of the community. So they weren't, they weren't giving it to him. They're giving it to the community and he is the trustee of the community. That was the counter argument, which even the secular court system appreciated and, of course, ruled in favor of the, of the community. Well, that's right, exactly. And that's what we're talking about here. Why are the people devoted to the king? Not like that guy. And I'm not even criticizing him. It's just my naivete. Because that's because he was saying, you know, this guy, I'm sure he thought he was a good guy, and he probably thought he would be a good senator, and he thought, you know, I'll hook my train, my, my car up to his train, and I'll get, and I'll get uh, carried along, and I'll, uh, and I'll have a career too. But that's not a devotion to the guy, because once the guy lost, I throw him, and I get the next guy. But when we understand that the king is truly devoted to the people, and he is one with the people, so this uplifts me, because the king is uplifted. And that's what he would talk about. So if he said, if Nimius Hamalucha, she had timing by Rotz and Shabalucha, Mushrish the Etza Matsmusa shall a nefesh, who were a Raymondist at me shall a nefesh. This idea that he is truly set out to be king, and again, we're not just talking about the one person who was the king, but that idea, whether it's leadership of your community, or it's leadership in your family, or it's leadership in some contextual circumstance, or whatever the leadership is, that experience that experience or that uh, characteristic better is an illustration of the very essence of his identity and again in our context we're talking about Hashem's identity the very essence of Hashem's identity is his passion to be connected with us which uplifts us to him and results in our obedience to him and the two have to go together why did, like you're drawing some kind of distinction between like that that uh, political pundit and what we're doing, right? Because the political guy is, you know, he likes the guy that he worked on his staff, but he's ultimately looking over his shoulder. How's he going to help me? Meaning, if you were to tell the guy, "Look, if you work here twenty hours a day for six months, this guy will win," but then he's going to discard you. If there's nothing in it for you. He's going to say, "Well, then I'm not interested." Or as, as we would say in the world of religion, if you tell a Catholic that if you work very hard and you do all the stuff, but you're still not going to go to heaven, so then forget it. What's the point? Well, you tell the Muslim guy, you can do it, but you're not getting the 72 cleaning ladies. He's like, well, then forget it. But if you tell the Jew, you're going to give up your entire Olam Haba, so that's all the stories. I'm not recommending it, but all these great settings. I give up my Olam Haba for this person. So in the, and what we're talking about is you're actually attracted in some way. To the to, essence. To the essence. That's of correct. Your, Not just about how it's going to make me better. Correct. It might, it, that's a side thing that might be true, but right. it's irrelevant. Correct. And that's the risk that we're willing to take. Because again, in the marketing department, they say, tell them that if they do mitzvahs, they'll go to heaven. They'll have a happier life. They'll have a better life. And we believe it's not untrue. But, and it works. You know, it works for a while. You know, we can, you know, bribe people. You know, our life is better than yours. And, but, it, I mean, I, we know this even just from our own life experience. I mean, there are plenty of people. And sometimes it, it's a very dis disturbing consequence. You know, they 
um, commit themselves to Torah mitzvahs, whether they're the first person in their family to keep Shabbos in 10 generations, or they're Alta Zaidi and everybody down the line was the Rav and the Sheikh. At some point, you know, they say, yeah, this is for me. And then they wake up one day and they go, well, this didn't work out the way I planned. Like, I didn't get what I wanted. I mean, I'll just share my own story or a story. So uh, 20 years ago, we went on this weight loss thing. You know, we had this big weight loss program. If telling you about it, you know, we should and then let it. It's like the cabbage soup diet or something? No, this was the, we call it the, the water diet. It was called the blue sheet because the piece of paper that it was on was blue. Yeah, he was the mashpia. <laughs> and every week we would weigh in and so on. And I got totally caught up in it. And every week I would weigh in on Thursday morning. I couldn't wait for Thursday mornings to come. And Thursday night we had a front and we would sit here and have to report in their weight. So the first week I lost 10 pounds. I mean, it was crazy. That's how fat I was. Sign me up. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> the next week, you know, that was a lot because I was, that's how fat I was. I mean, you know. And then I would lose four pounds every week. And every week we'd come in and I was so proud. I couldn't wait to tell everybody how I lost four pounds that week. And it was going for a number of weeks. And at this point, I had lost about, uh, I would say, 30 pounds or more, more than 30. I ultimately wound up losing about 55 pounds. We said, it was a joke. We lost half our short. <laughs> I mean, it was actually the greatest <laughs> public relations we ever did. We had all these Litvisha guys coming. because I mean, the, the word gets around that all these Lubavitchers are losing weight with Chassidus. I mean, really, it's a shame that we didn't keep it up because it really was a great opportunity. So anyway, one, I remember this clear as day. One Thursday morning, I mean, every Thursday morning, I couldn't wait to get up in the morning and weigh myself. I was so excited. I woke up and I, you know, get in the bathroom and I get on the scale and I had been a good boy. We had a bunch of our rules. One rule was uh, change more than your scale. You know, it's not just about losing weight. It's really about changing your whole relationship with food. You know, what is food? Is food fun or is it food fuel? And we used to have a for brain. We used to have like, you know, what, what's the spiritual lesson that we learned from this? Can you get a life outside of food? You know, the, we had all of these slogans and it was a whole cult. Anyway, that morning I get up and I remember this and I lost no weight that week. Mm. I had been perfectly compliant. I had done everything right. I hadn't cheated. I hadn't had an extra. It's the first week you didn't lose weight? I didn't lose any weight. And I was very disappointed. And I remember having that uh, in the Bible, he was left alone at night. And I had this struggle. I mean, on the one hand, I was like, screw it. I'm not doing this anymore. This is stupid. On the other hand, I said, well, look, am I doing this just to lose weight? Or am I doing this because I need to reorient myself around my relationship with Kashmir's? And I, you know, we talked about it. We said, yeah, I mean, you know, this is what they say. You know, the body starts to find its level. Now, I still had weight to lose. I still was not at my normal weight. And then, you know, I kept going. In the weeks subsequent, I, I lost Another uh, about 15 How many pounds. guys were in this group? Well, it was initially, you know, six or eight, and then it grew, and then people didn't stay. I mean, it, 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 we, we got to the point where, like, if you're not going to do this seriously, then you don't want to stay because you had to come every week and say what your weight was. Mm -hmm. You know, how much did you lose? And I said, well, I cheated. And then, and then <laughs> it was like they, they didn't want to stay anymore, you know, because it's embarrassing. And, and then, and, and you're also sort of, you know, you're, 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 you're dragging the group down because the whole thing is just a sport. Anyway, the reason why I bring this up is because the lesson that I learned there in my you know, personal avoido, because that was really a, a spiritual life experience, was what am I doing this for? Am I doing it because I want this reward? You know, it's very nice. Everybody compliments you and they say nice things to you and say, oh, you look great and I didn't recognize you. You know, and I had all these great stories. I had someone in my house, not someone I see regularly, but someone I know came to visit and said, are you Chaya's brother? <laughs> you know, I mean, this is a person I know and they're in my house. Like you meet them randomly, you know, downtown, you know, and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But I, so what am I doing this for? Am I doing it for the compliments? Am I doing it so I'll look good and my clothes will fit and I'll be thin and so Or am I doing this because I'm trying to truly uh, reorient myself, you know, it's like, what it's both? well, we used to talk about like the mezuzah covers, you know, the Rebbe has a campaign to have very simple mezuzah covers because we all know the story, you know, people spend $300 on the silver case and they throw out the instructions. I don't know, you know, 
type of thing. I mean, th this is a not uncommon phenomenon. You know, I bought this mezuzah in Israel. That means it's for sure possible, you know. And, you know, like, and it was $350 from a very orthodox person. You know, like, Because again, what is the objective here? So this is what the Alter Rebbe is re or I mean, I'm sorry, the Friedrich Rebbe is reorienting us around. What is the purpose of our compliance? Is it because we are doing something that Hashem wants or we do what we want? And again, they don't have to be mutually exclusive. I mean, it does work out nicely that as a person overcomes their impulses, they get nice compliments and you feel better and your clothes fit better and you're not huffing and puffing and panting. You know, it, it, there's a lot of these letters from uh, he published from Shem Munjin in a book on him. So part of the book of letters that he wrote to his son in Yeshiva. So at one time uh, he had some sort of medical scare, I don't know what it was, and he was like suddenly put on this very regimented diet. You know, you know about that, <laughs> so he writes to his son, you know, it's crazy that for all these years I know what this says about Gashmias and I can't do it. And I can't, in other words, I wasn't able to get myself to do it in the service of my nefesh kiss. But suddenly now when the doctor tells it to me and it's in the service of my nefesh Bahamas, I'm able to do it. You know, it's an amazing thing. And, and, and it's not really a criticism because it's a wonderful program. But at the JLI retreat, I mean, you go to a class and say this and then the, it's like food and it's like so much and so over the top and they've toned it down i remember one year and you know the people who come are people obviously who have some means you know and they're from people and they're giving seduct like, it was all over the top don't you think you know it's, it, it's you know and they're not against it being five stars but this was like a little crazy you know so can you do both well we would say no and isn't that fascinating okay the very essence of Hashem's uh, identity is his characteristic of being exalted. Again, the definition of Hashem is he can't be the point. So that's the thing to say, but it's that idea. And that's brought out, and that motivates us to be passionate, to be desirous of being connected with Hashem. Um, so you said it's not the, he's not definable, but at the same time, the, the, the there's an aspect of, the, of the, elusiveness that we are drawn to. We are drawn to that quality these, of being struggles. exalted. I mean, this is our argument that a person in their ascent. I mean, again, I'm not here to. I don't know the difference, but you know, if, uh, the simplistic Freudian. I don't know if it's accurate, but the simplistic thing is people are just driven by their own selfish motives. And the only way to get people to do anything, you know, it's for economics, is to motivate them by something. Either it's money, which is the obvious thing, or it's fame, or it's fun, or it's glory. But ultimately, all they're really interested in is what it's going to do for them. And the argument of Hasidus is that what a person, what will motivate a person, I mean, that will motivate a person for sure, too, but it's motivating his nefesh abahams. What will motivate a person? to a level that he won't stop when he gets enough. Because at some point, you know, yeah, if you're working on the 10 hours a week, you make more money. But, you know, I'd rather sit on the couch for 10 hours a week. <laughs> but what is what motivates the person, what drives them, is the desire to get beyond themselves, to be connected with this exalted characteristic of godliness. So, yes, we are motivated by goodies. And that's why, like the Ramam even recommends it, you know, you tell a kid, if you do well in school, I'll buy you a cookie. You know, it's not, a, it's not evil, but it runs out. Because how many cookies can you have? And at some point, you know, it becomes a commercial deal. Well, I have enough cookies. You told me that if I dive for an hour, I'll get a cookie. And if I dive for two hours, I'll get two cookies. So I'll decide how many cookies I want. But also, uh, it, it, the, in terms of the, what the, the, the problem of being transactional, that's, that isn't really the rutsum of Hashem. Correct. It's not at all. Right. It's my rutsum. Right. Like that guy who's saying, you know, I thought it was my instant career. Well, what I'm saying is, is that what, what Hashem's ruts on what he wants from us is not necessarily exactly the thing itself that we're doing. It's the relationship well, that's, that's, well, that's yes, but, through that. Right? You well, know, like uh, this is a story, I'll tell you what it is afterwards. It's, he's a character himself, but this guy lives in Israel and his parents call him and his father says, you know, we were scheduled to come on Tuesday, but you know, now we have to come on Wednesday. 
So pick us up with, well, you know, dad, I love you, but I rearranged my whole schedule. And his father says, well, you know, your mother's got some medical issues and the doctor, that, you know, that I love, father, father says, no, don't love me so much, just pick me up on Wednesday. So it, you can't really separate out the two because mitzvahs are not just busy work, like I better give him something to do so they don't kill each other. Hashem really, really, really wants you to do that. And I was having this discussion uh, about uh, the kids in the, in the girls' high school, you know, even more so now. And it is understandable, you know, COVID has really drained them. You know, imagine if you're in 12th grade, so you had ninth grade, then 10th grade was COVID, 11th grade was still, I mean, it's draining on them. They're getting, you know, there's a little even more attitude than usual. And so, you know, it's starting to come out in different ways. You know, and essentially their argument is, why does God give us all this service? I mean, which is, like I would say, there's only one question. Easy, easy question. There's only one question. <laughs> You know, why can't you eat me? Eat me the milk. Nobody cares. There's only one question people have. Why is there suffering? Why can't everybody just be happy all the time? Why can't everybody be happy? God is God. He's infinite. And if you're happy, it doesn't take away from my happiness. And if you're healthy, it doesn't take away from my health. And if you have friends and if you have family and you have love, so why can't God make everybody happy? So why is God creating all of this? So I must be in the story. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the concept of the mother of the name was of Yoyna. And he used to spend his whole entire day dominating and learning. Davin, he's going a few minutes and it's time for many down for hours. So, and somehow, whatever he had, you wish, somehow he was able to pay the bills and put bread on the table. And then came the time he had to marry off his daughter. So, other chassidim heard him talking to God. And he said, you know, I need to marry off my daughter, so you need to give me money. So he says, no, you might tell me I should go to work, but you know my schedule, I don't have time to work. So then you'll say, well, okay, so you'll make me find the mitzvah, I'll find, the, find something. So I don't want to find. I don't want. To, I don't want my gain to come from somebody else's loss. And then so you'll say, okay, so I'll win the lottery. I don't want to win the lottery. There's all these halachic childless about the lottery, or whatever it is. <laughs> so I will say, what am I supposed to do? You don't want to work. You don't want to go to the lottery. You don't want to find the mitzvah. So I'm supposed to do this. You're God. You can't figure it out. <laughs> I mean, there's a certain argument. Like, why doesn't God just make everybody? I mean. Why? He's God. And then he makes me want potato chips and says, don't eat potato chips. So don't make me want it. So, you know, what are you going to say? So, I mean, not that they ask me, but I say unto them in my best rabbi voice, I mean, this is the question. Do you love God? You know, are you willing to put aside what you want for what God wants? That's really what it comes down to. You should love the Lord your God. Do you really love God? What it, meaning, if you have someone in your house who's allergic to peanuts, you say, well, I don't care. I like peanuts. What do you mean? But your child will get sick if they if you have peanuts. Well, I don't care. I like peanuts. Right. Because if I love my child, I don't have peanuts. So God said, I don't like it. Well, well why did you do this? Right. But he doesn't like it. If you love God, then you'll do what God asks you to do. All right. We'll stop here. Isn't